In prokaryotic cells, such as bacterial cells, once we synthesize the mRNA molecule, that mRNA molecule will consist of a continuous sequence of codons that can be used by the ribosomes of that bacterial cell to synthesize a given polypeptide chain. In fact, because of this, because the mRNA molecule in prokaryotic cells does not have to be modified in any way following the process of transcription, translation usually begins on that mRNA molecule before it is actually synthesized. And this is in contrast to how it takes place inside our cells, inside eukaryotic cells. So inside bacterial cells and many other prokaryotic cells, trans uh, uh, translation, the process of protein synthesis begins on that mRNA molecule before that mRNA molecule is actually completely synthesized and that's because the newly synthesized mRNA molecule in prokaryotic cells consists of a continuous sequence of codons. So if blue means we have these codons, then the entire mRNA molecule in prokaryotic cells consists of this blue region because these blue regions are the codons that express that particular sequence on the polypeptide chain. Now, for quite some time, we thought the same exact thing was true in eukaryotic cells, such as human cells, but in 1977, Philip Sharp and Richard Roberts basically discovered that this was not true when it came to mRNA in eukaryotic cells. In fact, in eukaryotic cells, the newly synthesized mRNA molecule consists of these intron sections, these sequences of nucleotides that do not code for any protein. And they also contain these exons, which were the regions that contained the codons that did code for that particular polypeptide chain. So instead of looking like this one, instead of having a continuous blue section, the mRNA molecule in eukaryotic cells, such as our own human cells, consist of these intervening sections known as introns. In fact, the INT means intervening sequence of nucleotides. So we have one, two, three, four green regions, the introns in this particular mRNA, and we have one, two, three, four, five of these exons that contain the codons that will be used by the ribosomes to basically synthesize our polypeptide. So the major difference between these prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells is that our eukaryotic mRNA, once it is synthesized, it contains these introns and therefore it cannot be used directly to synthesize the proteins. It has to be modified and these introns have to be removed while the exons have to be glued, spliced together before that ribosome can actually synthesize the protein. And this is not true in prokaryotic cells because they don't contain the introns and that's exactly why transcription and translation can take place at the same exact time as we'll discuss in more detail in future lectures. Now, on average, in humans, a human gene contains about eight introns. But for those genes that are very, very large, for example, tens of thousands of nucleotides long, we can have as many as hundreds of these introns in a given gene. Now, the question is, once the eukaryotic cell actually synthesizes this pre-mRNA molecule, so this mRNA molecule that is not in its fully functional and modified form is commonly known as the precursor mRNA, the pre-mRNA, or the primary mRNA. And so, once we form the primary mRNA molecule, how exactly do we modify this molecule? And at what stage do we actually take out these introns? 
Well, basically within our cell, we have this complex of special proteins and special RNA molecules that aggregate and combine together to form a complex, a structure known as a spliceosome. And the spliceosome is responsible for essentially locating these introns, removing the introns while at the same time gluing together, splicing together those exons. And this can be seen in the following diagram. Now, on top of essentially removing the introns, these mRNA molecules in our cells and other eukaryotic cells are modified in two other ways. We basically cap the beginning with a special type of nucleotide sequence, and that's called the capping process. And at the end of that mRNA, we add an additional sequence that consists of a polyadenosine nucleotides, as shown in the following diagram. And we'll discuss what that means and what that is used for in more detail in a future lecture. In this lecture, we're simply going to introduce the fact that in prokaryotic cells, we don't have this process taking place, but in eukaryotic cells, we do have the process of mRNA modification. So, as soon as we synthesize that particular mRNA, that mRNA is known as the primary mRNA, the precursor mRNA, or the pre-mRNA molecule, and it consists of these introns shown in green and the exons shown in blue. So let's call this exon number one, exon number two, and exon number three. Now, first, we basically, we basically create these two modifications. We cap our five end, and we basically add the poly A tail on the other end of that particular mRNA molecule. And what this basically allows that mRNA molecule to do is it prevents the mRNA molecule from being, the great, uh, from being broken down, and it also allows it to basically reach that final destination. And we'll discuss more about that in a future lecture. Now, once we cap this end, and once we add that tail, the next process is the splicing process. So essentially this spliceosome moves onto our molecule, it removes these introns by essentially noticing specific sequences at the beginning of the introns. And by removing the introns, it then, is a, it, it, it then basically connects these exons by forming the proper phosphodiester linkages. And so eventually, we form the following mature and fully functional mRNA molecule that now consists of only this co these coding regions that contain the codons that can be read by that particular ribosome and synthesize that polypeptide chain. Now, notice that a common feature in, in the splicing process, in the splicing mechanism, is that the exons are actually ordered in the same sequential manner that the gene had those coding regions on the DNA molecule. So initially, we began with exon number one, exon number two, exon number three, and what we see here is exon number one followed by exon number two followed by exon number three. So this is usually what we see in the process of splicing. And we'll discuss how this actually takes place and why these modifications actually exist in much more detail when we get into the process of transcription and translation.